again to Nyla Slug. Um, Woo! Yay. And everyone for contributing to that. It's great. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited to welcome uh, Danny Nimu. Uh, I will stick to what I have decided is the the aesthetic of Teddy Bear Talks and not really explain anything and allow him to explain as he likes. And uh, yeah, please welcome Danny. This is going to be great. Uh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Can you all see this? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, good. So, my name's Danny Nemu, and I'm here to talk about the apocalypse in art and science. But what has the apocalypse got to do with art and science, I hear you ask? <laughs> Thinking of things like this, images of death and destruction and the end of the world. Um, that's not the apocalypse we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the, the word as it comes from the Greek, and it comes from, I'm going to do my best here, apa and kalupto which is un and cover, or away and cover. It means to remove a veil, and that's the word that we have in English, revelation. Re is away, and vellum is a veil. So other cognates there are unveiling, disclosure, and discovery. And the secondary, the, the meaning that we associate with it, which is the doom and destruction, comes from a very specific vision that a very specific man had and wrote into a book which became the last book of the Bible, which is called Apocalypse, and the first word of the book is the book is apocalypse. Um, so, this is St Paul's apocalypse on the road to Damascus, and you can see something that was hidden. This angel, in this case, being revealed. And when you see the word apocalypse in the Bible, this is what you see. For example, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. So a revelation is something we can bring to a party, and uh, maybe someone else will have an interpretation for it. It's um, not the end of the world. <laughs> now, in case you thought <laughs> we would let the, uh, the angels take all the glory in this story, I want to introduce El Diavolo, and here he is, um, in Gillespie Tartini's dream, playing the fiddle to him. And uh, this is the song he played, I'm going to play it, to Tartini, and then Tartini wrote it down when he woke up. And it's called Trilo del Diavolo. And it goes like this. Yeah. So there he is. This is, a, this is a form of revelation. Seeing something in a dream which you then bring back into the world afterwards. Nietzsche spoke about revelation in these terms. He said, Revelation in the sense that something becomes suddenly visible and audible with indescribable certainty and accuracy. Everything seems to present itself as the readiest, the correctest, and the simplest means of expression. And then he talks a little bit more about what it's like. Everything happens quite involuntarily, as if in a tempestuous, temp tempestuous outburst of freedom, of absoluteness, of power and divinity. Ecstasy, a flood of tears, fine thrills and quiverings to the very toes. One is the mere incarnation, mouthpiece or medium of an almighty power. I have never had any choice in the matter. And this is Nietzsche. And we were, I was chatting to someone about him a little bit earlier today and he really changed very much the way we think about uh, power and pity in the world, Nietzsche. The final artist we're going to talk about is Mozart. He had a bit of a better time of it. Nietzsche, interestingly, he, had, he wrote the first part of Thus Spoke Zarathustra in 10 days when he had a fit of tuberculosis. He was a very sickly man all his life and in his worst ever winter he wrote this book. Mozart wrote, when he was alone and of good cheer, say, travelling in a carriage or walking after a good meal or during the night when I cannot sleep. Whence and how they come, I know not, nor can I force them. He's talking about his musical pieces. Nor do I hear in my imagination the part successively, but all at once, in a pleasing, lively dream. What he's talking about here is a hypnagogic trance, which is a state in between being asleep and being awake. And this is a state where we get a lot of both artists and scientists having their revelations. The committing to paper is done quickly enough because it's all finished, is what he said. So what has this got to do with science, I hear you ask? Science is about the careful measurement of things, it's about uh, bubbling test tubes and Richard Dawkins presenting his ideas on things, and um, uh, journals and peer review and rigorous academic thought. 
uh, is it not? Well, that is certainly part of science, and this here is the structural theory. Sorry, it's the structure of the 30S ribosomal subunit. Fantastic, um, but fantastic. But where did the actual structural theory itself come from? It came from uh, Kekula when he was. One fine summer evening, as I was returning by the last omnibus, I fell into a reverie, and lo, the atoms were gambling before my eyes. Two smaller atoms united to form a pair. Two larger ones formed a tra chain, dragging the smaller ones after them. The cry of the conductor, clap and road, awakened me from my dreaming. So he went home, and then he sketched the structural theory down, and this has become the basis of how we think about organic chemistry, how we think about um, chemicals, how they fit together. It, the numbers didn't work for benzene. Um, there was far too much carbon and not enough hydrogen, and he couldn't work out until one day I was sitting writing at my textbook, but my thoughts were elsewhere. I turned my chair towards the fire and dozed. Again, atoms were gambling before my eyes, but look, what was that? One of the snakes had seized hold of its own tail, and the form whirled mockingly. This was the form of the benzene ring, but what he saw there was the Ouroboros, which is interesting in itself because the Ouroboros is the, the form of the Midgard serpent. The Midgard serpent is a, is a snake which, which, which goes around the world in Norse mythology and uh, at the Norse apocalypse or the Norse at uh, Ragnarok it's the Midgard serpent which destroys the world. So he saw this, uh, this image and he understood that to be the benzene ring and that's, that's why we know what the shape of the benzene ring is. All from a dream. So we're not talking about careful measurement, we're talking about something else in science and that is the Eureka moment. This is Archimedes who had his Eureka moment and ran through the streets of Greece uh, naked, apparently. Eureka means I found it, which implies that it was hidden and then it's being found. So we're talking about a discovery, and discovery is of course a discover. Things waiting in the shadows for their covers to be dissed. And we're back with our old friend, <laughs> Apocalypse. But that was a long time ago, so let's talk about a slightly more recent Apocalypse. Uh, Melvin Calvin, who, had, who won a Nobel Prize for Chemistry for the Calvin Cycle. And he discovered that whilst he was in a car park waiting for his wife. Suddenly, in a matter of seconds, the cyclic character of the path of, the, of carbon became apparent to me. And he's talking about a really complicated uh, uh, cycle, which is the basis of photosynthesis. And, and um, he wasn't thinking about that at the time, but that's what came to him in this, in this flash. Nikola Tesla. He was walking along in Budapest, in, a, uh, in Central Park in Budapest, reciting poetry with a friend, and he was struck by a vision, frozen to the spot by a vision of um, the AC motor, which appeared to him with all the, clar with all the clarity of metal. <laughs> and um, this is the AC motor which powers our national grids at the moment. Uh, it's used in many, many, many things. We can't really imagine the world without it. And in fact, without any of, pat of Nikola Tesla's other patents. Now, he never made a calculation and he never made a blueprint, he never made diagrams. What he did was he would lie down on the couch uh, at night, sometimes during the day. I see, saw new scenes, at first blurred and indistinct. They would flit away when I tried to concentrate my attention on them. They gained strength and distinctness, and finally assumed the concreteness of real things. I needed no models, drawing, or, or experiments. And this man took about 700 patents. Uh, you can see some of them here. Uh, the AC motor, the Tesla coil, which is the basis of radio tele television. Um, robotics, the analogic gate, cosmic waves which he discovered, and standing waves. Very difficult to imagine the world without this man's um, apocalypses. And we're talking, and this is another guy who had a flash of inspiration, and it came from some source invisible and undefinable. Um, when he was a young man, when he was a teenager, he was visited by God and given the mission to represent thought as, uh, as, as processes, mathematical processes. This is what he says anyway. And uh, he came up with Boolean algebra. Boolean algebra, algebra is the basis of a computer processor. Whenever you run a Google search, that's Boolean algebra that you're using. It came to him in a, in a sudden flash. And this is uh, Ramanujan, who was an Indian mathematician. He was extremely poor. He didn't even have enough money for paper most of the time. So he wrote his proofs. Uh, without writing the, uh, the workings out. And after he died, he died at the age of 33. And after he died, mathematicians set to, to try and work out what he, is, what he was doing and opened up entire new fields of maths. His, his mathematics are used in string theory at the moment. Yes. 
I, I was going to say, uh, is that the guy who solved Fermat's last theorem? I don't know. Okay. Is the answer the, to that? The, uh, the A squared, B squared, C squared thing. I still don't know. Okay. Um, is Paul still Okay. Sorry, carry um, on. I don't know. Um, but I, I don't know anything about maths. But um, his mathematics came to him from his family goddess, which appeared to him in dreams. And uh, he said this beautiful quote: "An equation for me has no meaning unless it represents a thought of God." And this is one of the things that his goddess uh, gave to him in his hypnagogic trance in the morning. So uh, we've talked about flashes of inspiration, uh, Tesla's vision in the car park. Um, or the Calvin cycle, which came, sorry, it was Calvin's vision in the car park, Tesla's vision in Budapest. We've talked about bull contemplating mysticism. There's another, another time when we get our revelations, which is in dreaming. We've talked about the Indian mathematician, we've talked about the devil playing this beautiful music to Tartini, and Lowy, who's an interesting character. He won his Nobel Prize for physiology. And he had a chat to his friend one day about chemical transmission, where he thought that new, uh, nerves uh, transmitted their, their, their information through, through uh, chemical transmission. But he couldn't think of a way to test this, and he forgot about it. And this is what he wrote 17 years later. It occurred to me at 6 o'clock in the morning that during the night I had written down something important, but I was unable to decipher the scroll. The next night, at 3 o'clock, the idea returned. If I had carefully considered it in the daytime, I would have undoubtedly rejected the kind of experiment I performed. So we're talking about a very different part of the mind which is working here. Uh, it's not the logical part, and in fact the logical part wouldn't have been very interested in that. So these are our hypnagogic trance. Can you hear the devil playing his violin? <laughs> Keep going. And waking out of dreaming is another time when, uh, when very important insights have come to people, including Einstein. Now, Einstein spent weeks in states of nervous confusion, and he was really upset about the fact that he couldn't get to the bottom of these physical uh, problems, or problems in physics, rather. And one morning, he woke as if a storm broke loose in my mind. Uh, he started scribbling, he got his theory down, he sent it off. Uh, it took him a couple of weeks, and then he went back to bed ill of all the strain, and that was the special theory of special relativity. So, genius. Einstein's a genius, isn't he? Uh, what does genius mean? Genius, according to the Romans, was a spirit, and there he is, that's a genius. He's got a, a tray on his hand because he, he was the spirit who would give us things from hidden dimensions. And what he would give us was inspiration. Inspiration, of course, comes from Latin as well, and it means to breathe into, in and spirare. It's the spirit who breathes information into you. Isn't that strange? <laughs> Alfred Wallace. What can you tell me about Alfred Wallace? <laughs> he, he, was, he actually made the discoveries before Darwin, but Darwin got the, he got the credit for it. <laughs> Marvellous, OK. So Alfred Wallace, he was a, an explorer uh, and a, a collector of specimens, and he was in the Malay Peninsula. Uh, there he is with his specimens. And a mosquito bit him, gave him malaria, and he spent three days in a malaria, with a malarial fever. And he was too ill to write, but when he, when he came out of his fever, he wrote down what he, had, uh, what he had discovered and put it in a packet and sent it to his friend Darwin. Darwin was used to receiving specimens from his travels and he was horrified to open it up and to find a theory exactly the same as his own, which he'd spent decades uh, working on, comparing specimens and doing all kinds of um, very deep work and uh, didn't want to publish because he was worried about uh, it being a very shocking theory. And it's not entirely sure, it's not entirely certain that he would have even published without this um, impetus from Alfred Warris. He published the following year. So it looks like the genius, sometimes, is pushing. He's got an urgent agenda. This is another chap, Isaac Newton, who discovered calculus and kept it to himself for 10 years. And he used to perform his... Uh, when he published, he would replace all the calculus with regular maths, so no one would find out about it. But Leibniz discovered it uh, on his own 10 years later, and uh, Newton fell into a, a terrible paranoia about how this happened. Um, now, <laughs> Newton discovered two things in the same year, it was the year 1066, and he fled London because, like all astronomers, he knew that comets were a symbol of God's wrath. 
and a uh, comet passed over London in 1664, followed immediately by the, or followed very soon after by the, by the, uh, the, by the plague. And another one passed over in 1665, he'd seen enough, and he left before the Great Fire of London. Uh, so, so there he was, away, um, and this was a time of his life where he devoted most of, most of his time to alchemical experiments. He, a tenth of his library was uh, devoted to alchemical experiments. And gravity comes straight from the emerald tablet of Hermes Trismegistus, as above, so below. And gravity was the first theory which, a universal theory, so it worked on the movements of planets and the movements at the at our, our, our level, apples falling and things like that. Before that, physics was a set of theories um, governing different areas. So he really brought the whole world together. So, uh, apocalypse. Apocalypse is something which happens to an individual, like this. But in fact, what, what, what happens is, is that apocalypse, actually, that, in, that insight which a person sees changes our world and opens up new realms which are hidden. For example, uh, Tesla's AC motor has totally changed the, the way we interact with the world. Uh, Einstein's ideas have changed the way we think about physics and changed the possibilities. I mean, Boolean al algebra is another example. I mean, you couldn't do a Google search without it. He's revealing something which is, revealing a world which is hidden. Illness is another area where we, so we talked about uh, the flash of insight, we talked about dozing scientists, we talked about illness, uh, Nietzsche and Wallace, the malarial evolutional chap, and we, let's talk about drugs. Um, Mark Pesky, who came up with virtual reality, which is about as much another world as you can imagine, he came up with that. Now let's talk about Carrie Mullis first. Um, I took plenty of LSD and I found it to be a mind-opening experience. It was certainly much more important than any courses I ever took. He took a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1993 for the RNA polymerase reaction, which is what we use when we do DNA testing. And he visualised the molecular concepts when he was on acid. And uh, he and actually was quite a lot of the 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 the. the the, the work after that, the working out the fine detail, was done by other people. So again, you're talking about two different parts of the mind. The analytical mind and the creative mind. And that's the RNA uh, polymerase reaction. Mark Pesky, he says something beautiful about virtual reality. He's talking about his experience with psychedelics. And he says, psychedelics certainly been, psychedelics have certainly been facilitators or catalysts for that. The most striking example is all the cyber safe protocols. I mean, wham, it came to me just like that, and I just saw them. I got the big picture, but the big picture said, OK, well, you know roughly how to make it work. Now you have to go in and do the detail, right? And this is, uh, so this was the basis of virtual reality. And also he said something fantastic about Blitz. He said, my Blitz was revealed through the psychedelic experience. Now, I won't make any attributions to what the divine is, but if psychedelics reveal the divine or allow, to you, or allow you to eminentize it, to see it physically, or this sort of thing, wouldn't it make sense for that moment to be synonymous with the moment of revealing what your bliss is? Sue Blackmore, she's fond of cannabis and said, I can honestly say that without cannabis, most of my scientific research would never have been done and most of my books uh, on psychology would never have been written. She wrote The Meme Machine, which is again describing a, a whole different layer of uh, our world, which we can't normally see. Or... And Sam Patterson, who is, was named 1996 Inventor of the Year. He makes all kinds of um, bicycle cogs. And his, the way he does it is by going down to the beach, smoking his pipe, and doodling cogs until, in a brief flash, a complete solution goes off. That's when I start sketching like mad. If I'm lucky, I can draw it all out in the sketch. I don't fully comprehend it until it's finished. What are we talking about here? Um, the unconscious whatever that might be. Milton Erickson talked about it in terms of the creative and healing part of the brain. Uh, his own insights, which became the basis of NLP, were, came to him in blinding flashes of light. So what's NLP? Neuro-linguistic programming. It's a, way of, it's a way of reprogramming the mind, if you like. So Freud is the man who invented the unconscious, or discovered the unconscious, although he called it the subconscious. And he was talking about, um, he called it the subconscious because he thought that it needed to be subservient, submissive to the conscious. 
and uh, he thought about it as a very unruly place, the seat of neurosis, which didn't respect chronology or um, morals or anything like that. Now we have to remember, we have to remember about, about Freud and about drug-fueled revelation generally is that you need to be quite careful with what drugs you're using because the specific nature of the drug influences the revelation. And he was a coke fiend. Um, he spent ten, 10 years of uh, lively coke use. And the nature of his revolution was A, he invented the ego. Uh, <laughs> B, he, he reduced everything that crossed the mind to sex. And C, he, demand, he wanted the unconscious to be subservient to the subconscious, to the conscious, I apologize. Finally, meditation. Um, Swedenborg was a, uh, a polyglot and a, the foremost mineralogist in Europe when he was alive uh, in the 1700s. And when he was a child, whenever he concentrated, he used to meditate on his breath. And angels would visit him and teach him further breath techniques. And he had imaginary friends. Um, his imaginary friends lasted with him until adulthood. And his parents were so impressed with his imaginary friends that with the wisdom of them that they believed in them as well. He was also visited by God, uh, who followed him home uh, in London, apparently, one occasion. <laughs> this is what he said about um, well, what we would call the subatomic world. This universal, including its smallest particles, is a work coherent as a unit, to the extent that no one part can be touched and affected without some sense of it overflowing to all the rest. What he's talking about here is Bell's interconnectedness which uh, kind of physics caught up with about uh, 250 years later after we had lots of you know, new experiments. He also said, the smaller and closer the parts are to the simple substratum, the smaller they are in mass, their dissimilarities soften, their imperfections decrease, and their forms become more perfect. They are also lighter and quicker in their motion. He's talking about uh, atoms or even the subatomic world here, back in the 1700s. And if we're going to talk about meditation, we should probably talk about Buddha. And he said this. He talked about innumerable millions of kalapas in perpetual motion and flux, constantly forming and dissolving, each one 467,656, the size of a particle of dust raised by a chariot's wheel in summer. So the world he's describing there is astonishing. Astonishingly close to how we think of the world now even with the idea of trying to get across the, the size of it. So if you don't, uh, there, are other, there are other rituals you can engage in. If it's not science, you can go to the Spiritist Church, which is always very interesting. I don't suggest you go there to believe in it, but, I, but I, it can be very interesting when you go. These are all Spiritist scientists. Alfred Wallace, for example, the... Um... Thank you very much for your talk. Oh, sorry. Mm. <coughs> Bye-bye. Yeah. So Alfred Wallace, he was a Spiritist. Uh, as was Marie Curie, who is about one of the very few people in, ever to get two Nobel Prizes, uh, the first woman who won a Nobel Prize. She used to use the seance, used to treat the seance as an experiment, as an experiment. Uh, she took detailed notes, she had controls. Um, Sir William Crookes uh, also treated the seance as, a, as an experiment, and he nearly got kicked out of the Royal Society for reporting what he'd seen, including levitation, spontaneous appearance of writing <laughs> and uh, he did some of the first work in plasma uh, plasma chemistry and nuclear chemistry um, so in spiritism there's the idea that spirits give information from the other side and these are uh, scientists who've picked up information from some very interesting places alchemy as we said newton was an alchemist as was paracelsus and when he used to write he would write until, with boots and spurs and fully dressed, he throws himself into bed and rests merely for three hours or so, then writes on again. So we're talking about uh, a very speedy transmission, a very urgent transmission. So, let's talk about apocalyptic sciences. Um, Paracelsus. Paracelsus was the man who united medicine, alchemy, and natural philosophy. He was the first person to see that those three fields are part of the same thing. So this is, in a sense, an unveiling, a lifting of a veil between different uh, fields. Newton did the same thing with mechanics, maths, and astronomy, and Swedenborg did the same thing with his hierarchy of forms. It's one of the things that our, uh, apocalyptic scientists have in common. 
They also often think they're chosen by God. Paracelsus felt he was chosen by God to blot out all the fantasies of elaborate and false works. This was the man who attacked um, classical medicine, which was the idea that a disease was an, an imbalance. He said, no, it's not. Um, a disease is a thing, and he would tune into the nature of the disease and then tune into the, a metal or to a plant which had that same signature and use the plant to treat the disease. And this is the basis of modern pharmacology, the idea that you can use a certain agent to treat a specific disease. Newton saw his mission in the anagram of his name, uh, Yehovah Sanctus Unus. He believed he was chosen by God to interpret the book of Daniel. He wasn't, his interest in, uh, in planetary motion, his interest in chronology and all that was secondary to the, uh, his interest in, in, in scripture. He was trying to date the final, um, he was trying to date the end, the end of time really. And Swedenborg thought he was chosen to announce the coming of the new church following the last judgment. And Bull also uh, thought he was being, he'd been given a mission. There's another interesting thing about apocalyptic scientists. Um, a lot of them do obsess about the end of the world. Paracelsus, his last book was called Prophecy for the Next 24 Years. Uh, it, it talked about floods and the coming of the Antichrist and all those kind of things. Newton wrote 4,500 4, pages on an apocalyptic investigation. It took 50 years of his life. He never came up with a final date. And Swedenborg, as we said, thought the last judgment would come in 1757. This hasn't finished. Uh, real top scientists are still worrying about the end of the world. Einstein made these three quotes. I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. Yeah. Problems cannot be solved at the same level of awareness that created them, and a new type of thinking is essential if mankind is to survive and move towards high levels. So this first one here is talking about the vulgar idea of the apocalypse that we often have about the end of the world. This second one He's talking about scientific progress, the solutions to problems being from outside of the world you know. And the third one, a new type of thinking is essential if mankind is to survive and move towards higher areas. He's taking, make, making the same point, but about geopolitics. He was really worried about what would happen. There's actually another way in which Einstein was very apocalyptic, in that he came up with uh, E equals MC squared, and without that we wouldn't have any nuclear weapons. So in a sense he actually brought us closer to our possible destruction. Uh, these two scientists, Feynman and Oppenheimer, worked on the Manhattan Project. Oppenheimer died a nervous wreck, uh, totally um, worried about the fact that he brought a nuke into the world that he thought was going to be the end for all of us. Um, Feynman too. Haw and Stephen Hawking, finally, um, wrote this on Yahoo Answers quite recently. In a world that is in chaos politically, socially, environmentally, how can the human race sustain another hundred years? His answer about a month later was, I don't know. So, as we come to the end of my talk, how do we do this? How do we bring the apocalypse into our lives? Well, firstly, we can learn to meditate, which is always very good. Or we can visit the seance. Or automatic writing. Automatic writing is where you um, take some paper and you just let your hand go, either writing or drawing. This is actually quite dangerous unless you dress up like a Japanese schoolgirl. <laughs> <laughs> Drugs. That is how you make a joint. <laughs> um, taking drugs is a very good way to open uh, new insights. However, we need to be careful with our doses. And uh, making a nice joint for tobacco, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you really want to get some insights, make a big joint. <laughs> if it's mushrooms, what was the full McKenna? Five. Okay. Five grams of mushrooms, please. Fresh or dried? Uh, dried. dried. <laughs> and most importantly, one of the things that is important, most importantly here is silence. The parts of your brain which, uh, which work with language are not the parts of your brain which receive insights. If we had some more time, we could talk about neurobiology. But um, when, you, when, you, when you take drugs or when you meditate, when you meditate, of course, you're silent. But when you take drugs, it's very good to sit in complete silence with your friends and to see what comes up. And there's another sense in which silence is very important. 
Um, I, my website uh, has discusses apocalyptic topics, and as you can imagine, I get all kinds of emails from people who think they are the Messiah. <laughs> And I, you know, if your insight is that you are the Messiah, I suggest very strongly that you keep that to yourself. <laughs> so finally, what remains for me to do is plug my book. That's my website. You can see the stickers all around there. My book is in the process of editing because my own apocalypse, my own series of apocalypses, which led to the book, was, um, well, I'll tell you about it actually. I, I was an insomniac for most of my life and one day, I, I smoked a big bong actually, and I had some very uh, interesting experiences, in, in somatic experiences. And after that, I found that my, my insomnia took on a... it changed a little bit, and I would get a very urgent desire or, uh, to write something. And, 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 and I would uh, pick up a pen and I'd write, and I collected about 90 of these just scraps of paper. And uh, a friend of mine saw uh, some writing I'd done on the internet. She said, have you got any more? And I said, I've just got these horrible scraps of paper. And she said, can I, can I read one? And I, I read one to her because they were scrolls. And she helped me categorise them and uh, put them into a book, which I've written. But to be honest, it, it, it needs a good editor. And uh, I'm in the process of re-editing it. So there it is. If you'd like to look at it, it's on my website. Um, thank you very much. It's a damn good book, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> and the third edition is going to be even better. <laughs> So that's the end of my talk. If anyone would like to ask some questions and ask questions of each other and not just of me, yes. I, I had a really, really boring question to ask. Um, <laughs> yes. I, well done, Kev. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of how. Let's have it. Let's have it. Do you know Thomas Kuhn? So Thomas Kuhn is a philosopher of science who talks about the idea that there are moments within uh, science where there's a sudden explosion. Uh, so something like the general, the special theory of relativity invoke an explosion within that uh, field of physics, uh, which means that uh, people kind of go, oh, someone's discovered something. Let's do a load, shitload of work. It's, I, I, I'm kind of interested in whether or not um, does the interest in the apocalypse precipitate or come after? Mm. Does that make sense? Or that yeah, it wasn't a boring question. It's a really good question. The reason I got interested in this whole field uh, was because I did a dissertation on... Um, I was comparing uh, 17th century apocalyptic movements and current apocalyptic movements, particularly, particularly the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I, and, I, and I looked at a whole bunch of scientists, um, Paracelsus and, um, and a bunch more, and loads of them were really, really thinking about the apocalypse uh, or, or eschatology. Like, for example, the Puritans in, 19, oh, sorry, in 1605, they set sail to the New World. So that was very much an, uh, a hidden was revealed, something that was unknown became known to them. But um, 1605, a Puritan called Francis Bacon developed the scientific method. All happened in very much the same period, and, and the, the move to America that the Puritans made was very much vocalised in terms of we're going to go and found New Jerusalem in the in the in the new era. You find that these the event seems to coincide when you get like a, an upsurge of apocalyptic art, for example. You get like a whole load of apocalypses in the first century BC to the first century AD. You get this period of all these kind of apocalyptic. When I'm, I'm talking about like the apocalypse of, of John, for example, but there's loads of them. There's apocalypse of Adam, and there's there's hundreds of these texts, and they all kind of flourished in this era, and then that very local community got destroyed by the Romans, and not only that, but the story which which the people of Judea had been following got spread out to the entire world. So it did make a massive change in the world. And what you're talking about there is Kuhn's scientific revolutions. Think about what happened after Newton. You know, he brought in the space of one year into this world, calculus, which is the mathematics of moving bodies. Before that, you couldn't really work out how something behaved. You couldn't predict something moving, right? And he brought the, the theory of gravity into the world. So that opened up massive new areas of, of study, and that's what the apocalypse is. It's the lifting of a veil, something that's hidden, something that we really can't make sense of, becomes subject to rational thought through the new things that have been discovered, through these new formulas that can be applied. Do you see what I'm saying, why the individual becomes collective and why it's not just important for that one particular person who's respected in his field? Because it changes the entire world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. global course, yeah. ramifications. 
And what you have in Europe is you, you have this kind of apocalyptic wave which starts in the 14th century. In Italy, you have these new arts, you have these new ideas. For example, you have objectivity in art. You have the idea of the, the canvas being a window onto another world and the artist stepping out of it. And you get this idea of um, perspective, for example, applying mathematics to the picture. And that's a very similar idea to doing an experiment on a thing, putting a frame around it, stepping outside of it, and applying mathematics to the world. So you get the same idea of objectivity in mathematics popping up first in art, you get it in music, uh, you get it in magic, as well with the idea of a circle and um, certain names which are worked out with magical mathematical squares. You get it all over and you get it, and you get this wave that kicks off there in the Renaissance and then it goes, it goes north into Germany and you get the Reformation. You get like the 15, 1526, I think it was, Luther, not this thing on the wall. So you get a whole religious revolution happening in Germany and it went west into Spain and you get the voyages of discovery so you get the, the new world discovered and then you get the French sun kings and then you get the English uh, renaissance which is the, the scientific renaissance so as this kind of wave spread across Europe and it spread it spread actually as far as the shores of the new world where it decimated the populations there so these, there was this wave which transformed everywhere it went but it took quite a long time so an apocalypse is something which happens firstly to an individual and then to a community but also that community, it can kind of form a wave. And now we've got a very interesting situation where we have a world which waves move very much faster in this world. And there's a whole lot of apocalyptic art coming out at the moment, a, whole, a ridiculous number of apocalyptic films. The film Apocalypto or Independence Day or you know, these massive, these films which show destruction of, of, of worlds. That's what I mean in this, case, in this sense. You get, it, you get it also in the, uh, in the 16th century, poems on these themes you get. Paradise Lost or something like that. Yeah, that kind of stuff. It, it, it pops up in various formats. But I guess uh, I was being unclear, because there's this other idea of apocalypse being a new, a new realm. You get it in music, you get polytonal music, for example, happening in the Renaissance. Before that, you didn't have it. So you didn't have this idea of stuff going on at the same, at the same place. And then you get a whole new bunch of music in the, the, end, of the, 19th, the end of the 19th century, uh, where the, the melody kind of gets lost in the, in the harmonies. And that's a, kind of, that's a, that's a new idea. So it opens up new, new areas for the mind to explore. And but it's like clean, like, uh, you know, it's the paradigm shift as soon as the revelation or the apocalyptic moment or whatever, then you accept it and then it doesn't become apocalyptic anymore. Well, I mean, if you look at it and you look at what happened in the 17th century, you had the 80 Years' War, you had the 30 Years' War, you had areas of Germany where two thirds of the male population wiped out, you had hundreds and hundreds of villages burned. You know, the whole of Europe went bankrupt. And the introduction of, for example, firearms into Europe, uh, it was a big deal. <coughs> you know, the introduction of the printing press made revolutionary ideas spread more easily, and they spread particularly amongst um, reformists um, and Protestants. Right? So, so these things all play off each other. You know, it's not just a, a revolution in science. It's a revolution in art. It's a revolution in um, social relations. It's a revolution in... Quite close to the idea of zeitgeist. Yeah. So the, the spirit of the time. Is, is, this, is this a Christian sentiment that you're uh, expressing? Uh, I don't know. I think okay. more contemporary, <laughs> more contemporary <laughs> equivalent, I think, would be the end of the Mayan long count, which some people saw was the end of the world, whereas the Mayans always conceived it as the start of the new age. But it's also equivalent to the Card 13 in the tarot deck, which is death or its change. And I think this dichotomy between the apocalypse and revelation has always existed. And yeah. the end is not necessarily the, uh, the end. It's the like, beginning. Yeah, the end fucking, uh, dinosaurs got fucking, they got a fair share of the standard, <laughs> standard model of apocalypse. And without that, like, there would be no, none of this at all. Like mammals, mammals with fingers that could manipulate stuff and create mm. fucking MacBooks and marble tables and like, <laughs> little, Cubby holes underground where we can but, but we talk really about ourselves. Sometimes. Sometimes. Let's take the dinosaurs upstairs. Um, <laughs> and I'd just like to say thank you very much to Dolly for organising this. Oh, thanks very much to Danny. That was a fantastic talk. And, uh, to everyone. <laughs> yeah! That's, yeah. yeah.